Hello Students Dynamics, this is Dr. Dan Baker and we're transitioning into another topic within particle kinetics and that's looking at work and energy. Now for most students in dynamics, work and energy feels like a comfortable pair of pants because you've covered this topic before in physics, you probably covered it in high school physics, and so if you're thoroughly confused by all the Newtonian kinetics, at least conservation of energy should fit quite well, okay? Because like I said, I think you've seen it primarily before. Now, um, just to highlight here again that there's three different topics in kinetics. And kinetics, again, is essentially relating forces to motion. And so we covered Newtonian, which for particles was just the sum of forces as a vector is equal to mass times acceleration. We now are in work energy, or work and energy, because they are separate terms. And then we'll do impulse and momentum. And one thing that you'll see is that both work energy and also impulse momentum are both velocity-based techniques. And really the one of the differences is that work by definition, right? Work is the product or the dot product of force and distance. And so it's essentially forces applied over a distance, whereas impulse is forces applied over time. Okay, so we'll see that moving forward, but just kind of pointing out that there are some very distinct differences between these three different techniques, even though they're all three relating forces to motion, and even though all three of them need free body diagrams, because they're all kinetics, and because fundamentally they're all dealing with forces. That's really what it comes down to. That's why they need the free body diagrams. Okay, so I like approaching this topic, work and energy, moving from what you probably know really well, which I mentioned is conservation of mechanical energy, and then getting more detailed and getting into work itself. So let's talk about conservation of mechanical energy. And another way of saying this is it's just the exchange of energy between potential energy and kinetic energy. Okay, so we tend to use the variable E for mechanical energy. And so fundamentally what we're saying here is that E1 is equal to E2. We have no losses, right? That's what comes into the statement here about conservation. We have no loss in mechanical energy. Another way you can think about these systems that you'll probably remember is it's just really just an exchange of energy among height, which we call gravitational potential energy, and velocity, which is kinetic energy and springs, which is elastic potential energy. Okay, so we can write out our general equation. We can say that the sum, now I'm gonna put these sums out front and these sums are gonna be referencing if we have multiple particles. So while these equations were great for a single particle, it turns out they also can be used for multiple particles. And so we have our kinetic energy sub one, the sub ones and sub two is gonna be initial and final. And we add to that our potential energy initial. I'm gonna use a little color coding as I move through these so you can see which terms are associated with the different kinetic and potential energy. Another summation out front here for multiple particles. And then we have our final kinetic energy, so Ke2, plus our potential energy, Pe2. All right, so the more usable form of this is gonna include all the variables. It's kind of a long equation, so I'm gonna squeeze it over here to the left. So once again, a summation for multiple particles. 
just highlighting that that's also what that summation is referring to. Our kinetic energy is 1 half mv1 squared. Our potential energy is made up of two different types of potential. One's gravitational, mgh1, plus our elastic potential, 1 half k delta 1 squared. Now, I like using delta instead of h, excuse me, delta instead of x, because I think delta better represents a change from neutral, and I'll talk about this as we move below, but remember that that spring potential energy is based upon a difference of the spring elongation from neutral. And then we have, again, a summation for multiple particles. Our final kinetic, 1 half mv2 squared, and then our two potential energy terms, mgh2, and our spring potential, 1 half k delta 2 squared. So as I mentioned, you could put a box around this one if you wanted to. This is really our working equation for conservation of mechanical energy. And I just want to highlight a couple things. Um, one of those is that h is defined as the distance above a datum. So it turns out that h is the only term in this entire equation that's directional. Okay, of course velocity is directional, but it's squared. Delta is directional, but it's squared. But h1 and h2 are the only terms which we have to measure above a datum. And so if you just choose to put your datum at the very highest point that a particle is going to reach in a problem, the other h's, beyond, you know, that one's going to be zero, right, at the highest point. But any other h's that you compute are going to need to be negative. Okay, so we're always measuring h upwards um, and calling that positive. Um, other details here is that the delta is defined as the displacement of a spring from neutral. And another word for neutral is unstretched. Okay, unstretched or unloaded, just when it's sitting there. And we already put our note there that our summations were for multiple particles. So of the three terms, I usually find that students are least familiar with spring potential energy, at least the nuances of it. So let's look at three different small case studies here. So if here is our spring, and it's attached to a block, and that block has a mass m, we're going to put a datum for all three of these little case studies, which is going to be right here. And basically, that's going to be the unstretched datum. And so at this point right here, we could say that the spring is neutral. And so if we apply um, our elastic potential energy equation of 1 half k times delta squared, it's going to equal 0. And the reason it equals zero is because delta equals zero. And just also a reminder that k is a force per length. Okay, it's called a spring constant. And so we just end up with a force per length from k. Uh, another reminder here is that a spring force, so spring potential energy and spring force have two different equations. Spring force comes from Hooke's law. F sub s is equal to negative k times delta. And the negative comes into play because the spring force is opposite the displacement vector. Okay, and so I'll show that here in these next two diagrams. So if we happen to have, we move this mass over to the left, and so we've compressed this spring. So let me continue my datum down through here. And so what we could show is that we have displaced the mass over some distance delta 1. And so once again, this is compressed. 
I think it's also useful. Let me just go ahead and draw some free body diagrams because we'll be doing that a lot here um, in this chapter as well. And so if it has a mass, we can also assume it has a weight as long as we have gravity. And then we'll also have a normal force. But if delta is equal to zero, we're not going to have any spring force. In the compressed state, having the same mass, we have our weight force, our normal force. Now the delta, if we're compressing, that's going to the left. Okay, so our spring force being the opposite of delta, opposite direction, F sub s, is going to be going to the right. And again, that's related by this negative sign, that this delta direction and this F sub s direction are in the opposite direction from one another. And that we additionally could write on here that our potential energy, so this is basically kind of a little table here listing out the free body diagram and our potential energy. So once again, 1 half K times delta 1 squared. And this is going to be some value. And then we additionally have a third system here. Well, let's say that we stretch the spring out. So we move our mass over to the right, which puts our delta to the centroid here, delta 2 to the right. And so this is a stretched case. And so is your potential energy of, of a stretched and compressed, if delta 1 distance, the magnitude, is the same as delta 2 distance, the magnitude, isn't it also true that your potential energy is 1 half K times delta, this would be delta 2, but once again, if delta 1 is equal to delta 2, aren't these both the same value? And they are. Because energy is not a directional term. Recognize in looking at our equation that there's not a single vector arrow in that equation. Okay, so fundamentally, energy is a scalar. So energy is a scalar quantity. Which is a double-edged sword. It's good and it's bad. It's good because we don't have to worry about vector arrows. It's bad because we can't split this equation into two different versions, okay? Essentially into an X, X component version and a Y component version. It is the only energy equation. And so fundamentally, you can only have one unknown in this one very long equation. And so coming back down to my springs, I could additionally draw my free body diagram of my compressed case, again, with a weight force, again, with a normal force. And we're assuming here a smooth surface, this is why I didn't add any friction. But the main thing I want to highlight here is just the direction of this spring force is opposite again delta. So putting it to the left because my displacement was to the right. Okay, so F sub S is equal to negative K delta. And really, just to be explicit here, we could write this as a vector equation just to assign that directionality. Otherwise, we're kind of assuming that it's all linear, which it, which it is, right? F sub S and delta have to be matched up in the same direction. Kind of like sum of forces equal mass times acceleration, that the force and the mass are going to be along the same line and in the same direction. All right, so that's the basics of conservation of mechanical energy. Hopefully, none of that, like I said, is a big shock, that it should all be a general review um, of this relationship between kinetic energy and potential energy. Um, and just like I said, just a little bit deeper dive here into elastic potential energy and also Hooke's law, which relates the spring force direction to our displacement direction. Hope you're having a great day.